You don't go to Notre Dame University to learn something. You go to Notre Dame to be somebody. So said the coach of the Fighting Irish, Lou Holtz. Hello and a warm welcome to all the viewers of Wizards of the Street. I'm your host, Ramesh Tamani. So how did Notre Dame, his alma mater, and his years at Fidelity shape him? And today, where does he spot opportunity? My guest manages over a $7 billion corpus at Fidelity International Discovery Fund. He also co-manages the Fidelity Sustainable Equity Fund. Let's hear directly from him. Please help me welcome from Fidelity Investments, Portfolio Manager, Bill Kennedy. Bill, welcome to Wizards. Hi, thank you very much, Ramesh. Very nice to see you. Bill, it's a great honor to have you. Yeah. Uh, let me start with the early years. You had a degree yeah. in economics. Yep. Given the course that your career took in the yeah. world of investments, Absolutely. if you had a do-over, what major would you pick? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. I wouldn't change anything. I mean, I've had such a great run investing. The world of investing has you know, treated me very, very well. I was an economics major, as you mentioned before. Um, I studied economics, uh, and the one thing you learn when you study economics is that it's hard to predict the direction of the economy. It's hard to predict, you know, the direction of interest rates. And, you know, given what's happening all around the world, it's hard to predict the direction of inflation. The one thing I did learn at Notre Dame and in a lot of other places was, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, businesses are, that are run well by good entrepreneurs that have their shareholders in mind and have society in mind tend to do well over a long period of time. Um, it, what would I change? Um, I would probably change nothing. The good thing I loved about the program I was in, it was really flexible. I could study economics, and I learned in economics that it is very difficult to predict the outcomes of the economy. So I decided to take on a lot of business classes. So I took finance, accounting, um, marketing, management, investments, but also that it was flexible enough where I could take you know, philosophy class, uh, theology class, you know, a class on Asian history, and that allowed me to kind of fine tune a different part of investment. You know, business classes will teach you what's good, you know, how to read a balance sheet, how to understand a P&L, and how to understand how businesses function day to day. And that's the science of investing. But to me, what really helps me ultimately, and I think you'd agree with me and a lot of the people that have sat in this chair would, it's the art of investing that's really important. Reading the management teams, reading the market, Reading, you know, there's a lot of nuance in investing. Psychology too. Psychology, exactly. And I'll tell you, my my one of my, my one of my kids is a psychology major, and I, you know, reading human behavior is really important in the world of investing, and you know that helped me a lot and helped me kind of fine tune that art of investing that I think is really important, and I think people underestimate how valuable that is. Yeah, well, Buffett taught us that that the yeah. market swims between fear and greed and. If you can conquer that emotion, you're probably ahead of this game. Exactly. Anyway, yep. but you talked about taking a class in Asian history. Yeah. So my question is, how does a student in Indiana, Notre Dame, get interested <laughs> in India and emerging markets? Well, you know, it was fascinating because back then, this is, think of the late 80s. Japan was just clobbering everybody. They were producing better cars. They were producing better consumer electronics. They were consuming, they were producing things cheaper and better than pretty much anywhere in the world. Everybody in the United States was worrying about losing market share. They were worried about losing, you know, competitiveness to Japan. Um, I just read a book about semiconductors. The semiconductor industry was going through a big uh, change in the United States because companies like Sony were just producing much better goods um, than, you know, th their peers in the United States. And so I took a class on Asian history just to figure out how did this happen? And the thing that really piqued my interest was Japan was doing very, very well, but there were other countries, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, that were starting to really... The smaller tigers. Yeah, the smaller Asian tigers that were really kind of bubbling to the surface. And I said, that's where the next opportunity is going to be. You figured that out sitting in Notre Dame class? Yes, I did, because you could see the economic growth, and you could see that they were making a lot of the reforms, and they were learning from the Japanese to see some of the mistakes that were made in Japan, but they had that base of the... You know, the, the Chinese family companies that were really incredibly entrepreneurial and could grow their businesses and were, you know, incredible, you know, capitalists by their inherent nature. And they, you know, so you could see that these, these countries were about to just burst in at the seams in terms of economic growth. So that really excited me. So I wound up taking a job in private equity in America with the Prudential. 
And I was there for a year, and just by happenstance, an opportunity came up to work for them in Asia. And that was a, a dream come true. So I picked up, you know, I was 22 years old, picked up my bags, and moved to Hong Kong. Are you seeing India now becoming the China plus one plus two strategy? Well, I think China has gotten more expensive. And if you ask companies in general, they, they're, they're more biased to moving to Vietnam or to Mexico. However, you're starting to see companies, as you know, like Foxconn is producing, Apple. You know, app, producing Apple products here in India. And my understanding is the goal is to, you know, by 2025, to have a material amount of the iPhones manufactured here. So India is benefiting from that, definitely. Um, but my sense is, is that, um, you know, that will be a process that will certainly develop over the next couple of years. The only thing that really needs, in, needs to happen in India is just favor, favorable government policy to make that, accelerate that process. Which they are doing perhaps yeah. through PLI and through I, budget reform. But you're a student of history and you're a student of economics. Yeah. Does that suggest to you at some point Asia becomes uncompetitive and you move to, say, Africa? Well, the one thing in Asia that has really impressed me is the ability to have productivity gains. What, what, eventually, what ultimately grows an economy? Population growth, which most of Asia, bar China, has and then productivity gains. And if you look at the productivity gains that have been you know, accomplished, particularly here in India, in Vietnam, um, Taiwan, Korea, I mean, it's been pretty impressive. And a lot of countries in Asia continue to go up the value-added curve, and they have high savings pools and very high education rates. And that's what makes, you know, that's a beautiful combination for productivity. When you met, uh over dinner, you made an interesting point that you felt that Indian companies deserved a better multiple than Chinese companies. Why yeah. is that? Well, when you think about it, what goes into a PE multiple? I look at it and say, it's the growth rate that they, that they can do over the midterm. It's the cost of equity, the cost, cost of equity that they're facing, and their ROE, okay? I would argue that given the structural growth in India, the demographic dynamics here, which are so much more positive. So much more positive than China. I mean, China's you know, population has peaked. India's population continues to grow. Um, so the growth rates structurally are better here in India. You have um, cost of equity is higher here in India. Clearly, interest rates are higher in India. I would argue that that will come down over time, but they're still higher. But the ROEs in India, if you take an Indian company versus a Chinese company, and that's what impressed me when I first came to India, is how high the ROEs are relative to their emerging market and their developed market peers. And I do believe it's really a function of the fact that management teams, because they're mostly owned by promoters, tend to sweat the assets because they're watching, they're turning the lights off because at the end of the day. Because capital is important. Exactly, and capital <laughs> has a cost because they don't want to be diluted and interest rates are higher here, so the cost of capital is higher. Therefore, assets are very valuable and they're going to sweat them and to try to improve the returns they can when earn on them. interest them. rates are zero, everything is, looks interesting. Exactly. That's not true at a high interest exactly. rate. Exactly, and that's exactly what happened in Japan, and unfortunately it's happening in China as we speak. It's a curse. The low interest yeah. rate became a curse. Uh, you came to India for the first time. Yeah. You've been coming frequently, I know that. Yeah. For the first time in which year? 1994. 1994, yeah. just after the big bubble of 92 had burst and yeah. foreign investors were allowed into India. Exactly, yeah. Right. And which is the first company that you met? Well, on the first day, I, yeah, the first company I met in India, first day, was HDFC. That's remarkable, isn't yeah, it? It's like it meeting Warren Buffett on your first day in uh, it know, really Omaha. Is. It really is. And, you know, it's just it, because I had, uh, two nights ago, I had dinner with Keki Mystery, and, you know, we were talking about it. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing when you can look at a company and, you know, by public disclosures, it's still in my top holdings, um, and a company that has been able to withstand the test of time. You know, the management team at the time laid out a path for how they could grow 15 to 20 percent over a 20-year period of time. Now, if somebody, a company were to tell you that in today. In the 90s. Yeah, in the 90s. If a company were to tell you that today, you'd be pretty skeptical, wouldn't you? Of course. You know, but just given, you know, the demographic dynamics and given all of that, um, given, you know, the low penetration of mortgages, given the um, quality of the management team, the competitive environment, in 94, the case was, you know, that that could happen. The execution is clearly what, you know, myself as an analyst piece. at yeah. the time, as a young analyst, would have to monitor. Um, and, you know, clearly in looking in, you know, what they've done over that period of time, they've, you know, clearly executed. But, but do you believe that in 94 that they would grow at yeah, 20%? Yeah, 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 of course. It yeah. was that obvious to yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, 
a holding in, it, as of the latest disclosed holdings in the funds, it's, you know, clearly It's still been in, in your top 10, I think. Yeah. Uh, Bill, you come from a culture, Fidelity, which yeah. is known for stock picking, yeah. great oh, star yeah. managers yeah. out there. Talk to me a little about that. Gerald Tsai, Peter Lynch, all those yeah. are great names in Wall Street. Yep. What did you learn from them and how does that influence you today? I'll, I'll tell you, you know, the great thing about Fidelity is not only the individual personalities, you know, Jerry Tsai was an aggressive growth investor. Peter Lynch was, you know. The Magellan Fund. Magellan Fund, very famous investor. You know, right now we have a, an aggressive growth investor who's, you know, has phenomenal numbers. Will Danoff, um, Joel Tillinghouse, phenomenal numbers, deep value. The great thing about Fidelity is you get great mentors, but also you get people that, you know, the, the spectrum is so wide. So you can find somebody, you can always find somebody that agrees with you, but what I like about Fidelity is you can find people that disagree with you. Without being disagreeable. Without I being disagreeable. So what I try to do is I try to go out and hunt out the people that are, on the margin, you know, more value-oriented, because I tend to be growth-oriented. I'm, you know, I'm investing in India, so right. I, and I, I have a big overweight in emerging markets. So I go out and I try to find people that are a little bit more, you know, interested in buying deep, discounted, you know, companies that are inherently, you know, trading at single-digit PEs or, you know, the market just really doesn't like. And I try to under say, hey, listen, I've got this company in India. It's expensive, but, you know, this, this is kind of... This is my investment case. What do you think? And I want them to pick it apart to keep me honest. Have you ever introduced Peter Lynch to any stocks in India? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, um, uh, Keki Mystery did come in and talk to um, our senior senior management team at one point in time. And uh, you know, it, you know, Peter. I don't want to speak for Peter and his views on the company, but uh, you know, clearly the parallels between HDFC and Fannie Mae, you know, certainly rung a bell. And, and Peter Lynch was always a big fan of and all of his books of Fannie Mae. Well, the parallel between American television and Indian television is that we both need commercial breaks. We'll take a break, come back and chat some more with Bill Kennedy of Fidelity.